Good evening and welcome. Hi, my name is Sebastian. Hello, Derek. See, tonight Derek is my friendly face in first row. So if I'm getting anxious about talking to you, I just look at him. He's smiling, he's waving. Then everything is fine again. Hi. So I've been doing things with PHP and 2PHP for about 18 years now. Um, some 16 years ago, I started to work on this, this uh, thing called PHP Unit. Um, when I'm not at a conference giving a presentation about things, and when I'm not at home or on a plane or train or in a hotel room working on open source projects like PHP and PHP Unit and other tools, then I have to make a living, and I do that by helping teams build better software. Um, you can hire me. I'm, I'm, I'm fun to work with. I do basically everything that has to do with knowledge transfer around PHP and related technologies. That's my company. I'm not going to bore you with any advertisement or sales stuff. The only thing that I'm going to say is, because I keep getting asked about this, I've been saying for years that I'm going to write a book about PHP Unit. I'm actually working on it. But again, this year I failed to actually publish it, hopefully next year. So as I said earlier, I work as a consultant. Almost, that means that almost every week I get to work with a different team, I get to work with a different uh, code base, get to work with a different business problem, domain, area, whatever. And almost every time I see a code base for the first time, it looks to me like this. That is, of course, very dramatic. It's not as bad as that, like no white space and whatever. But in fact, once upon a time, a couple of years ago, I actually worked with a code base at a customer where there was no white space in the code because that was faster. <laughs> or so the developers believed, which in fact was true when the code was still being executed by PHP FI. It was slightly less true with PHP 3, and it stopped being true at all with PHP 4. And, but they still kept doing that, and it made the code hard to read, and it looked exactly like that if you opened it up in an IDE. There's no point in using an IDE if your code looks like that. But to me, if I look at, look at a code base for the very first time, I have no idea about the business problem the developers try to solve with the code. I have no idea what the architecture is, what the design is, um, and how the code is structured or organized. It looks like a jungle of characters to me. And that's not really good. That's not what we want. At least that's not what I want. That's not what I expect from code that I would like to work with. So. There's sometimes a re this is sometimes the reason for a code base looking like that. Technical people like technical solutions. Technical people are dri sometimes driven to implement something or solve a problem in a very technical way. Right? So I have a problem, or I'm given a task, and I immediately jump into thinking about implementation details. I want to write down code, and that's not always very helpful. So that's why this quote is at the very beginning of the Domain Driven Design book by Eric Evans. And looking back at my, not really career, but my journey um, as when it comes to computing and programming and software development, I can say that for me, personally, it exactly started like that. I was interested in technical details, I was interested in technology. It all started back in 1990, when I got this beautiful machine, which was an Amiga 500. And for about a, a week, I was content with playing some games, and then I wanted to figure out how to make games, and that's when I started to 
look into programming. I started with basic dialects, then ha at some point I had a basic dialect that allowed me to do some very limited amount of assembly language on the custom chips of the Amiga to make graphic effects go faster. And then I realized I don't really need that basic bullshit. I only want to do assembly because that's what this machine was built to do. And I learned assembly. Later on, I learned C, and that was fun. And I had technology, I had this machine, I wanted to do some stuff. I was only interested in technical details. I never really got to think about that at some point in the future, somebody else might be interested in understanding that code that I wrote, or, some, or that maybe I, 20 years later, 25 years later, would look at that code again and would not have the first clue at what the code does. And that's what happened to me. Two years ago, I took my Amiga 1200 back from storage, started doing assembly and C on it again. On backup, I found 2D, 3D graphics routines that I wrote in assembly 20, 25 years ago. They still work, but I for sure do not understand how the code does that. And I'm not alone with that, because back in the day, at least all the books on programming that I got my hands on, and I was really lucky because my, the local library in my hometown, they had a lot of books on computing, and they had this system of a notebook where you could write down wi uh, wishes for books that they should buy and offer for, for, for lending. And I got really lucky that they bought a couple of, of the books that I wanted, including this one. All of these books, they, none of these books told you anything about how to write good code, good code that other people can understand, code that lasts, code that is easy to maintain. They were all bogged down in technical details. Okay, you want to achieve this. This is how the chip works. This is how you tell the chip what to do. And that was great because it solved a technical problem for me, but of course it created problems in the long run. I like to say that I grew up, when, at least when it comes to programming, in the Amiga demo scene, 3D, 2D, real-time graphics effects, um, art, if you will, digital art. And some developers believe that code should be art. Yes, you can achieve art with code. That is what the demo scene is about, but code is not really art. Code should be crafted, it should be something that lasts, something that you can understand today and tomorrow. If you're interested in what you can do with code when it comes to art, this is a beautiful book that I can recommend. It's like 300 or 200 or 300 pages that all deal with a single line of code that if you run it on the C64, generates beautiful art. And it's weird that you can write so much about such a small line of code. Um, but it's worth a read. It's available for free online under Creative Commons, uh, unless you want to, want to buy it in paper, and then it costs a little bit. So, yes, you can achieve art with code, but code should not be an expression of art. Code should not be, should, should not even be called code, because code implies that something is encrypted. Code should not be cryptic, it, sh it should not be encrypted, it should not be mystical, it should not be magical. You should immediately understand from reading code what the problem is that you're trying to solve and what your solution for that problem is. You should stop thinking about writing code. And that's one of the things um, that domain-driven design wants to teach us and wants to give us as developers to become better at what we do. Because if you look at the heart of the software, what we do, that's the domain logic. If that is not easy to understand, if that is not easy to maintain, then you have a hard time trying to improve that over time, try to keep it going over time, or even in the short term, test it. That's not really nice. Which leads to the realization that you hopefully sooner or later have that 
your primary task as a developer is not to write code. It's not to write software. Your job is to understand and then solve a problem. And not every problem needs code to be solved. Sure, a lot of stuff can be solved with code, but every line of code that you don't write is a line of code that does not impede you in the future. Every line of code that you don't have is a line of code that cannot contain a bug, is a line of code that does not need to be tested. Software development is not about human-machine interaction. It's really simple to write a program that a machine can execute. It's a lot harder to write a program that you yourself understand a year from today or 10 years from today, or that your teammates, your coworkers, your colleagues understand today, that on the day that you have written it. That's what domain-driven design means with, with its ubiquitous language. You should use one language in communication with the customer, in communication with the business expert, between the developers, among the developers. Use the same names for things. Names are one of the hardest things um, when it comes to software development. And not only, but also related to that is the fact that teams change. People that have written something leave the team, even leave the company, and then the knowledge is lost. Yes, the code is still there, and the code, the software, contains the intent somehow. The machine can understand it, but whether the rest of the team that has never written it under still understands it, that's a different question. Coming at that problem from a different angle was Uncle Bob and the clean code movement. Clean code is code that can be read and enhanced by a developer other than the person who wrote it. Yes, that is important, but from personal experience, I mean, PHP Unit is now 16 years old. There are pieces of code in PHP Unit's code base that are that old. And sometimes I look at that code and I don't understand it anymore. Git, git blame, git annotate tells me that I wrote it five years ago, ten years ago, but I no longer understand it. And in most cases, what I do then is delete the code, understand the problem, and write code that solves that problem, but solves it in a way that is better understandable than the solution that I had before. Yeah, that's the book that talks about clean code. Clean code has unit and acceptance tests. N only having one does not really solve the problem. You can have an application that has lots of acceptance tests, for instance, using BHAT or Selenium, but those tests only tell you that this application does what it is supposed to be doing today. It does not tell you anything about how well that software is crafted and whether it can be adapted to change requirements tomorrow. On the other hand, only having unit tests only tells you that the software does what you have understood it should be doing, which not, does not necessarily mean that you have understood what it should be doing. And it only tells you that the smallest pieces work correctly and that they can be easily evolved over time and are easy to maintain. But that does not necessarily mean that you have built the right thing. So that's important to keep in mind. And then, of course, unit tests are code. Code is a very precise thing that tells the machine to do something, and the machine will do that as long as it's valid syntax, valid code, but that does not necessarily mean that it's something useful or that it's understandable. So I believe 
that not only the production code should be clean code and should be easy to understand by other developers, the same holds true for test code. Tests should be easy to understand. Yeah, not only by me today, not only by me tomorrow or in a year from now, but by all the rest of my team on the same day that I have written it. And if you want some bonus points, and it's easier than it appears at first glance, bonus points if the test code is understandable by non-developers. And I have an anecdote that I'd like to share at this point. So far, almost nobody believed me when I told that story, but it is true. Um, so I think it was two years ago, I was working from home that day, doing a, um, a code audit on a code base from a customer. I was looking at test code, I had tests uh, open in, in, in PHP Storm, and my uncle came for a visit. My uncle is a retired business analyst from uh, a reinsurance company. And he was like an hour early for, for dinner. I was still working. And he said, just wanted to say hi. Don't want to disturb you. Um, we're here. Uh, and uh, finish your work. Um, looking forward to you coming down in an hour or so. He said, no, no, you're not, not disturbing. I want, was uh, taking a break anyway. And uh, I said, yeah, and then, no, 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 continue. Uh, and then he stared at my screen. and he's, didn't stop staring at my screen. And I looked at him and said, don't let me disturb you. I'm, I'm just looking. And uh, this is really interesting and, and weird, because I think I understand what it says on the screen. It's just that it's a bit confusing with the dollar signs and the arrows. And some of the characters look weird. But I think this is from as a billing or accounting, and there's money, that's, and then there's some calculations with the money, and then there are accounts, and the money goes into the accounts. And I said, yes. So what is that? I said, that's software. That's what developers write into the computer when they develop software. And he said, huh. For, like, for the last 10, 15 years of his career, he was actually the domain expert on software projects, and he had a really hard time understanding what the developers were doing. And he, he sort of, let, later during dinner, he said he wished that he would have been shown something like that, or some of the output that comes out of the testing tool, which is what I showed him next. Um, and that made total sense to him. So believe it or not, true story. Uh, and it can be done, it can be that test code looks as simple, as almost as simple as human language and non-developers can understand it. Yeah, all ties comes back together to the week with this language, one la common language that everybody on the team uses. Yeah, I believe that not only the test code should be readable and understandable, but also the output. That's what the test docs output of PHP unit is about. That uses the conventions of test names, test class names, and test method names, and prints uh, documentation based on the tests uh, to the screen. And then maybe even the elephant can understand what you're doing, which is always nice. So talked about a lot of things without showing any code, which is kind of weird for a technical conference, so it's time to look at some code. And to give you an idea of what it feels like to me when I look at code for the first time, I'm going to show you some code. And I want you to tell me what that code does. Ten seconds are over. 
Who has heard about the 10 second rule? What does the 10 second rule say? So Derek says, if it takes longer than 10 seconds uh, to understand the code, then it's too complicated. Yes. But the true meaning of the 10 seconds rule is, if after 10 seconds you do not understand the code, delete it. <laughs> That's the very harsh German way of interpret interpreting the 10 second rule. So any guess, what, what is this about? So somebody said a test. That's Hopefully, kind of obvious when I'm giving a presentation and showing code, yes. What is the test about? It uses XPath to check that HTML contains a form, yeah. Now, would my uncle understand that? No. So I don't know about your uncle, Derek, but my uncle does not have any idea what XPath is, and he should not have to know that that exists. It's bad enough that I know that it exists. So maybe if I add a little bit more names to it, now it gets a little bit clearer, right? So. I have the problem that my laptop is standing really far away and that the font is really tiny over there and that the screen is over there and it's really hard to look at and I don't have all the slides memorized. So, yes. Lots of technical details. We make an HTTP request, we fetch some HTML from somewhere, we use something called DOM document and DOM XPath and we do some stuff and then in the end we assert that the length of a DOM note list, whatever that may be, is larger than zero. The developer on the left is the one who has just written that test. He's really, really, really happy that he was able to implement this, that he was able to find a technical solution to the problem that he wanted to solve. And the problem that he wanted to solve was this is a team working on a hotel booking engine thing. And what he wanted to test was, if I search for a room between two given dates in a specific hotel, will I be offered the correct rate? That is what he wanted to test. Which from the business perspective is very, very important because if rate calculation, if availability calculation does not work correctly, they have a problem. So really important business problem and he had a technical solution for that, that worked. The problem with that technical solution is that once he got the test to work, he stopped and thought that he was finished. Which technically or from a technical perspective he was, because he had found a solution that did exactly what he set out to do. But I don't believe for one second, let alone 10 seconds, that a week later he'll still be able to understand that code. Coworkers who had not seen that test code and they know the domain, something that you didn't know when I showed you the code first, they didn't understand what the test was about when they saw the test for the first time. That's the guy on the right. He sees the same thing in his IDE, like, like his coworker, and he does not understand what it is about. And that is the guy on the left that wrote the test like a week later when he looks at the test again, and he doesn't know what his technical solution does. Because if you look at the test code, you do not see what the test is about. You only see technical details. So let's start from the beginning. What should the test look like? Well, what do we need? We need to ask our hotel room booking engine, whatever, are there rooms available with this rate at that hotel between these two dates? 
So why should the test be any more complicated than this? It has a method that says exactly what the test is about. The availability is displayed correctly. So this is, from a scope point of view, this is an end-to-end -end test. I'm making a request to the website. It is an integration test, an end-to-end -end test, or what web frameworks usually refer to as a functional test, which trying to find a way of putting this without not being embarrassed later on when I watch the recording. So this is something that really upsets me, because functional test is a term in software engineering that has been well defined for 40, 50 years, which means a test about correctness of a piece of software. Does it function correctly? What on the web people usually mean by functional test is an acceptance test, but let's not Let's not get bogged down um, in those details. So this is what I want to see there. If I make a request, do I get the web page displayed that contains the information I'm interested in? And that's all the code that I want to see in such a test. I request the availability, and I use a hotel ID, a start date, and an end date. And then I use an assertion, not something like assert equals or assert greater than or whatever, but something that is very specific to my domain, that uses language from my business problem. Something that I immediately understand when I look at it and not see a jungle of technicalities like DOM nodes, DOM documents, XPath expressions, and so on. Yes, I will need those. for the technical implementation of what this does, but that's not what I want to see when I look at the test itself. Of course, I need maybe a private method in there that's re uh, request availability that gets the hotel ID, the start date, and the end date. And if you do the right thing and in your production code use value objects, objects that encapsulate data like hotel IDs and dates, then please do yourself a favor and also use these domain objects in your test code. Makes the tests so much easier to read and goes back to the idea of using the same language in different contexts. Yeah, and of course I have the HTTP request in there, but it's not in the main test code. And that's the first attempt of implementing that custom assertion. Just a private method that has a name that really explains what it is about, not 10 lines of DOM technicalities. Yes, those are still there, but they're hidden behind the facade of that method. And of course, if I want to go further, I can split that up and move the XPath thing into a separate method, makes it a little bit easier to read. Leads to problems though, or I get into problems, or into an area where I want to improve further, when I want to reuse that assertion. So, if I want to make it really reusable, then I should maybe implement a custom constraint object. So all the assertion methods that are built into PHP unit, the way they work is they create a constraint object. So for instance, if you use PHP units built in assert true, what happens internally is that it creates an is true object that is passed to an assert that method. And you can do the same with your custom constraints. Why does PHP unit do that? Because it uses something like is true the constraint object or the is equal constraint object, not only for assert true and assert equals, but also in the matchers for mock objects. And it could be, maybe not in this case, but in another case that you want that check 
that the availability was rendered correctly or is displayed correctly, not use that in an, as an assertion, but have the same logic uh, in, in a on a mock. And that's when you really need a constraint object. So we can implement an XPath const constraint, and then a rate is offered for room constraint that extends the XPath constraint. And then we can have an abstract class that has end-to-end -end test case, that is named end-to-end -end test case, which will be used as a base class for all our end-to-end -end, uh, tests that has domain-specific helper functions to make, for instance, a request for availability and has the domain-specific assertions that do something with the response. And then our assertion is as simple as creating the constraint object and passing the constraint object forward to assert that. And that makes it really easy to implement the inverse of that assertion. Maybe in some situations we want to verify that a specific rate is not offered. Also really important from a business point of view. I set up an environment in which a hotel is almost fully booked, and when I then ask for the availability, then I don't want a very, very cheap discount to be displayed, but a more expensive rate. So then I want to assert that the cheap rate is not offered. Yeah, and that brings us back to what we set out uh, to do. Now our test actually works with just these two lines, and there are no technical details that distract us from what the test is about inside the test method. We can do even more reuse. We still have the technical details in there for XPath expressions, and over the years, I've become really hesitant to add new assertions to PHP unit. PHP unit already has a lot of very specific technical assertions. Most of them you don't really need. They are syntactic sugar. There are other X unit frameworks out there that only have assert true, assert false, assert not null, maybe assert equals, but then it stops because you can build everything else from there. That's why these frameworks, why these assertions in these other frameworks usually have um, the optional parameter with the message so that you get a specific message when the assertion fails. PHP units assertions also have that, but it's rarely used because you have specific assertions that make that optional message parameter superfluous. So, I'm really hesitant now to add new assertions because there are so many and they should be, if they are specific, for instance, something as specific as technical details around XPath expressions and so on. By now, I think that should go into an extension. And I've been thinking that for quite a while, yet such an ex extension was never written. And luckily, at the most recent PHP unit code sprint, uh, Thomas Weinert implemented an extension for PHP unit that has XML-based, XPath-based assertions that make it a lot easier to write what we just did with a lot less code, which is really cool. If you need assertions like that, check out uh, this little project. It's already um, a lot of people already started using it. Uh, he's using it uh, in his own projects, kind of uh, cool. If you're interested in the technical details of how you write an extension for PHP unit, most importantly, packaging it so that it can be easily installed um, using either Composer or um, as a PHP archive, as a FAR. There's a presentation I recently gave um, at FrostCon about extending PHP unit, which not only talks about 
extending PHP units through custom assertions and constraint objects, but also goes into details about custom comparators, uh, test listeners, um, and other stuff. Test listeners are still the most common extension point that is used uh, for PHP unit because people want to see colorful cats on the command line when they run their tests rather, or emojis or whatever rather than dots and Fs and Es and so on. We're still not done with reuse. We can reuse the language from this end-to-end -end test that we just wrote and use a different implementation of the same assert method so that it makes sense to use in a unit test. Right, so we could write a unit test for the piece of code that calculates the availability without displaying it as HTML. This is a much smaller test. This is a real unit test. This allows us to test this domain logic with many, many, many different variants. Why can we do that? Because this test is a lot faster than the indirect test through the presentation layer. And that page shouldn't be white. <laughs> is it still white? That's awesome. Yeah, that's really weird. Yes. That's awesome. Not. It's not white anymore on my screen. So there's a reason why I do back-end programming, because I suck at front-end. <laughs> Apparently, I even suck at using an HTML, JavaScript, CSS-based presentation system thingy. thingy. Apparently, CSS and stuff is really hard. That's why I don't touch it. Um, sometimes hitting Control-R to reload the presentation 10 times solves the problem. Anyway, do not write code. Try not to be cryptic. The most cryptic thing I've ever seen, well, I've seen a lot of weird things that's, that comes with the job when you look at a different code base every week, and if you think that code that has no white space and is worked on in exactly that way. I mean, you could ha even if you believe that code without white space is executed faster, you could still use your, do yourself a favor and edit it properly with indentation and then during deployment strip out the white space. But they didn't do that because they didn't know that that is possible. Um, but that's not probably not even the, the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um, the weirdest templating engine I've ever seen was using M4 for templating in a website. I really hope that neither of you ever had to work with M4. Well, that guy over here excluded because I know that he has to deal with it. M4 is a language that was, uh, was built or is used by uh, the GNU auto tools. So if you do dot slash configure dash dash prefix blah 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 when you compile yourself P PHP from scratch, that's the Perl script that is generated from an M4 template using M4 whatever. It's really weird. That, but that's what it was meant for. I've worked a long time ago with a team that used M4 as a templating engine for their PHP-based website. And they did that because there was one guy on the team who thought this would be a brilliant idea to ensure his job. Because only he understood that. 
it goes without saying that you shouldn't do that or something like that. It's not, but it's not always an intention like that that leads to cryptic code. Try to avoid thinking about writing softwares, software systems as writing code. It's not something that is meant to be cryptic or magical or mystical. It's something that ideally documents how the processes of your business work. Yeah, write programs. I mean, I say that you should not write code, yet I keep talking about code because that terminology is so ingrained, at least in my mind. Hopefully, a future generation of software developers will not think about code anymore. Write programs and write programs that your coworkers understand today, write programs that you yourself understand tomorrow. That's really good. Or well, that would be really good. Software development is human human interaction. If you do not understand the requirement, ask. If you could implement, if you could understand that, that you should implement this or that, ask, should I implement A or B? What most developers usually do is they implement both. Then you, and then you have at least double the amount of code that you should have, double the amount of code that you need to test, and then probably end up not testing because it's too complicated. It's double the amount of code that you need to maintain, double the amount of code that can contain problems. Don't do that. Try to avoid code. I know, sounds really bizarre. I'm a technical person, I like to write code. But I really hate debugging code that I don't understand, so that's a conflict. Try to avoid writing code that you don't need, at least try that. And keep in mind that your job is not to write software. Your job is not to write a program. Your job is to solve a problem. To understand the problem, there are useful tools, and I can only give you my personal insight to that. For me, the best tool to understand the problem and find a solution to a problem is to think in test-driven development terms. If I have figured out that I need a piece of code to solve the problem, then write that piece of code test-driven. Yeah, that's what I mean by tests help us understand the problem. You want, you want to work in small increments to fully understand the problem. At least I cannot solve a decent sized business problem in one go. I need to iterate towards an understanding and iterate towards a solution in small steps and tests really help me find these small steps and find the solution. But tests only help when they can be understood. Yeah, it could be okay that I understand it right now, like the guy from the picture earlier, he was really happy that he found the technical solution, the right approach to express in code what he needed to do to verify the business problem that he set out to solve, but next day he did some other tasks in between and was not able to understand the XPath expression anymore. What am I doing here? Why am I doing that? Write code that lasts, write code that you understand even in the future. Be nice to future you, as some people call it. That's it. Any questions?
I'm told that I'm supposed to throw this at people that have questions. They didn't tell me if that's to make asking the question easier or to stop them from asking the question. It's a microphone. How very good. Do I have to throw it or can I kick it? See, it landed where you were sitting. You changed the requirements. That never happens. In your examples, I saw camel case notation mm -hmm. tests. Do you think we should implement uh, the best practices uh, PSR and and so on and so on in our tests. You should also love your test code. That means if you have coding guidelines for your production code, those coding guidelines also go for your test code. Guidelines have a purpose. Guidelines, is, for instance, for formatting, have the purpose of making the code easy to read. I'm not going to tell you what makes your code easy to read for you and your team. That is something that you and your team have to agree on. Whether that's camel case notation or snake case or some people use weird Unicode white space characters to make test methods readable. That's up to you. Use okay. what works for you. Okay, thank Ha, huh, now I know, don't need to throw anymore. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, I have a question about what is more important in tests, because in your uh, example cases, you were, for example, using a method that downloads a response from a server and mm -hmm. setting it in a private property. Mm -hmm. If I need a test that needs two responses or I forgot to, cause, uh, to call this method, I might have a test that uses response from previous. Uh, you cannot call. run into a situation where it uses the response from the previous because each test is executed okay. on a fresh object. But anyway, of course, that method was stripped down to fit on a slide for presentation okay. purposes. You would have some mechanism in that library that gives you vocabulary of domain language that makes sure that you have made the request. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to know that if you think it's more important that it's really nice to read mm -hmm. with just statement, uh, statements like, you know, do this, do this, or if, you know, occasional, uh, occasional uh, assign to variable is, uh, is okay. Yeah. Make it work first. So remember the guy who was confused the next day, on the day before he was confused, he made something work, and that's a very important first step. But when you made that test work, you should take a step back and try to make it readable. Okay. So it has to work, hopefully that's obvious, but it also has to be understandable. Both are important, but the making it work probably has to happen first. There are some people that, that say test-driven development should work like that, that you implement the code inside the test method first. So, so first you write a test method, then you write the code that makes a test pass inside the test method or inside a test class. And once that works, you use refactoring tools provided by your IDE to extract a new class, extract a new method. I wouldn't go as extremely as that, but make the test first work and then make it pretty. And over time, and that's again experience coming into play, over time 
you write tests from the beginning that are easy to understand because at some point it clicks and you start to think different. Uh, I've got a question of your answer. Um, when should we iterate our tests? We know where we, when we should iterate of our code, uh, when the business logic is changed, but mm -hmm. when we should iterate of our test. If, if something works, mm -hmm. we didn't touch that. You change the test when requirements change. So you have a piece of code that currently works, and you have tests for that piece of code that currently works, and now your requirements change. The first thing you do is adapt your tests to reflect the change requirements, and your existing and, and the tests fail because the code has not been adapted to that, and that's the next step. Don't change both at the same time. Okay, so when we don't change the code and the change doesn't fail, mm -hmm. uh, should we don't touch the tests? I don't understand that. We write an uh, ugly test. Yeah. And it works. Mm -hmm. It tests, in fa it passes, and sh when we should change that test? to be uh, pretty. Ah, so, so, so you don't need to make a change right now, yes. but um, you have a test and you're not happy with the test and you want to make it pretty, then make it pretty. When? <laughs> Every second Friday of the month in the afternoon, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> That sounded funnier than it was intended to be. Um, so actually, actually, I know some teams that do something like that because they realize that Friday afternoon, developers are not <laughs> as interested in working on things as they usually are. So they try to find a new, like to mix it up. So some teams, what they do is Friday afternoon or every second Friday in the afternoon or something like that. They don't work on current tickets, on, 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 on pressing matters. They do something else that's useful, code hygiene. Like m looking at the tests, making the tests better, looking at code coverage and seeing, okay, there is something that's important, but it's currently red, so let's write a test that makes that green. Or, I don't know, look at output from, from a static analysis tool and fix some things that are reported. <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you look at a professional kitchen, there are tasks that have to be done after each meal is prepared. There are tasks that have to, have to be done every hour. There are tasks that have to be done to clean up at the end of every day and there are tasks that need to be done every week and every month. And that is the same for code. The only difference is that it's not so obvious when nobody cleans. Yeah, when nobody cleans the kitchen, then either the health department closes down the restaurant because it's dirty or the fat, the grease explodes. Neither of both uh, outcomes is pleasant but you see it happen. You see that the kitchen gets dirty. It's not so easy with code because it's intangible. So you need to invest some time regularly, and the important thing is regularly. Yes, but uh, sometimes uh, your code, uh, no, always your code is uh, your business logic. But yeah. tests uh, are only assertions, and your assertions uh, can not change, uh, mm -hmm. but your code uh, should ha should change. And wh when 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 you should uh, go to that assertions and say, uh, oh, it's ugly. Maybe we okay. Because probably the next talk is about to start, so maybe one more question, and we can. Uh, I'm here all day tomorrow, and can continue the discussion. Yes. Hi. 
PHP unit testing and acceptance testing. Uh, I mean, is it a bad approach to have a separate PHP test cases than acceptance? What's the... This may sound funny, but I don't care about which tool you use to implement yep. your tests. Okay. Use the tool that you are comfortable with. And somebody is waving at me that I should stop talking and get the hell out of here. 